Muhammad Ali, born Cassius Marcellus Clay, trains for the fight of his life. Every guy thinks he can fight you, wants to take you on, and he's going to prove it someday in a bar, you know. I find nothing amusing or tolerable about this man. He's a disgrace to his country, his race. I just keep working and keep training, keep running. At nights at 9 o'clock, I get in, because that's when action starts. If I'm going to die, I'll die now, right here fighting you. If I'm going to die, you my enemy. I'm out to break Floyd Patterson's record. Cassius Clay goes into the record book with Corbett, Tunney, and Braddock as another who brought off one of the great upsets in the heavyweight history. It is befitting that I leave the game just like I came in, beating a big, bad monster who knocks out everybody and no one can whoop him. If I recall correctly, you said you were the people's champion? Yes, sir. Do you think that you're acting like a people's champion? You know my new name, Muhammad. Why do you want to say Cassius Clay when Howard yes. Cosell and everybody is calling you Muhammad Ali? Now why you got to be the one of all people? My name is Muhammad Ali, and you will announce it right there in the center of that ring after the fight if you don't do it now. No, Clay was not my name. It was a slave name. And I'm no longer Clay, I'm no longer a slave, so now I'm Muhammad Ali. Oh, how do you stand now with uh, the possibility of going to jail? Oh, I don't know. I'm just waiting any day now. It was here in Miami that Clay took the world title two years ago. I shook up the world! I shook up the world! His ranting and raving have all made him unpopular. He is hero now to few. From the Olympics with the medal uh, to your own hometown, did this make you a very big man in your own hometown? Did it completely change your life? Made me popular for a few days, but I wanted to do something good with it. I took my gold medal, thought I'd invented something. I said, man, I know I'm going to get my people freedom there. I'm the champion of the whole world, the Olympic champion. I know I can eat downtown now. And I went downtown that day, had my big old medal on, and went to the restaurants. At that time, black things weren't integrated. The black folks couldn't eat downtown. The lady said, we don't serve niggas. And I had to leave that restaurant in my hometown where I went to church and served in their Christianity and fought and dead and fought in all the wars. Just wanted to go medal and couldn't eat downtown. I said, something's wrong. I'm going to fight. Not for me, but to uplift my little brothers who are sleeping in the concrete floors today in America. Boxing is just to introduce me to the struggle. But my main fight is for freedom and equality, and this is what I plan to do in boxing. He has wisdom from outside the boxing world, which he has come here to share with us tonight. Here's Professor Muhammad Ali. I use my image to help or do all I can to stop a lot of trouble among our own people fighting and killing each other. If I'm gonna die, I'll die now, right here fighting you. If I'm gonna die, you my enemy. You my opposer when I want freedom. You my opposer when I want justice. You my opposer when I want equality. And you want me to go somewhere and fight, but you won't even stand up for me here at home. This is a CBS News special report. But government casualties now are put at 200 dead, wounded, or missing. At home, protests against the war persisted. Peace groups staged marches in many cities. Tell me, champ, would you have been prepared to go into the army if it hadn't I've been for the Vietnam War? No, under no conditions do we take part in wars to take lives of other humans. And I will say here boldly, now on television, no, I will not go 10,000 miles to help murder and kill. I find nothing amusing or interesting or tolerable about this man. He's a disgrace to his country his race and what he laughingly describes as his profession. He will inevitably go to prison, as well he should. If I recall correctly, you said you were the people's champion? Yes, sir. Do you think that you're acting like a people's champion? Yes, sir. He is sentenced to five years in prison and fined $10,000, the maximum penalty for the offense, which is a felony. While fighting imprisonment for his stand, Ali was also stripped of his title, denied a license to fight in the United States, and denied a visa to go overseas to fight. He was in a much tighter financial bind than most were aware of. The subject changed so many times I've, I've in that long sentence biggest. that I really, I'm gonna talk for a second now. Well, how do you stand now with uh, the possibility of going to jail? In a day now. As you know, the heavyweight champion of the world has just made his decision. He has rejected induction into the United States military forces. It is also his personal choice at this time to issue no statements, to talk to no one, though he has consented to sit here 
before this camera with this reporter. He has issued a written statement, however. He has taken the action that he has taken based upon his personal convictions and with a full realization of the possible consequences. When Ali's championship title was taken from him, he found friendship in Howard Cassell, who stood like few against Ali detractors and gave his support. No people gain freedom until some have to die, some lose their wealth, some give up money. Although faced with extreme opposition, Ali never wavered. He fought in court for five years while unable to work or even leave the country. One man of popularity can let the world know the problem. He, can, uh, he might lose a few dollars himself telling the truth, might lose his life, but he's helping millions. But if I kept my mouth shut just because I can make millions, this ain't doing nothing. So I just love the freedom and the flesh and blood of my people more so than I do the money. Finally, in 1971, his conviction was overturned. Do you have any regrets that you, um, you refused to join the army? Many people believe in fighting for the freedom, and this is just part of what I believed. So there's nothing that I regret, not at all. If I regret it, then it wasn't sincere. Do you still think of retirement? Well, I wanted to, but I thought about my children. I watched the baby cry another day. Ten years from now, that baby will just be ten years old, and I'll need money. He'll need school books. He'll need clothes, bus fare. So I'm just saving money now. I have three daughters and one son. Save all I can. So all I'm doing now, every month is saving at least 75% of my money for the future of my children. Putting it away for 15 years, I don't want to touch it. I don't need it. And don't have to worry about my children because this is a hard world. Don't nobody give you nothing. You have to work for it. And now Ali is behaving like the old Ali. One more knockdown in this round, the fight is automatically over. Bonavina is running. If he goes down again, it's over. Ali is the knockout winner at two minutes and three seconds by my unofficial clock of the final round. Larry, I'd like you to explain why you've been crying. You know, so I really respect a whole lot, really respect Ali a whole lot. It hurt you to punish him that way, didn't it? I feel that he fought the one of the baddest heavyweight in the world today, and you cannot take credit from him. Obviously, the things that you're going through now, would you like to comment on that? Well, I have what they call Parkinson syndrome. It causes a tremor in your hands and affects the speech. So all that old talk, I'm the baby, I have to slow down. <laughs> it seems to bug other people more than it does you. When I sit and talk to you, you seem to be fine with the speech and everything. Sometimes. It don't bother me. But I hope he gets it done. Yeah, yeah. We're all praying for you. I think in anything, whether, regardless to what the area, it's you and Martin Luther King for me. <laughs> it would take forever for me to tell you why, but uh, you made a young man believe that he could do anything. So uh, that's why you're very special to me. It's hard to believe all the years, everything pass between us. It's so hard to believe and so memorable. And now it's time to say to you, Muhammad, God bless you. You are exactly who you said you are. You never wavered. You are free to be who you want to be. I love you. This is a hard world. Don't nobody give you nothing. You have to work for it. 
it is befitting that I leave the game just like I came in, beating a big bad monster who knocks out everybody and no one can whoop him. No people gain freedom until some have to die, some lose the wealth, some give up money. If you have a purpose-driven life, it adds years to your life. You live longer. Let me share two stories with you. Story number one, we're interviewing one of those school teachers. She says, the first year I taught was heaven. The second year I taught was hell. I had five boys that second year, and they were incorrigible. And there was one kid in particular. He was impossible. One day, this kid's in the doorway of the classroom, and he's kicking and moving his arms and making noises, and I lost it. He, she said, I'm ashamed to say these words. But I walked towards that kid with the intention of kicking him. Thank heavens he got up and ran away. I kept walking. I went to the principal's office. I said, this is it. It's him or me. And the principal took the kid out. She said, I felt terrible. So I went to two of my colleagues and poured my heart out. And they said to me, you are not the key to every door. And as she said those words, she burst into tears in the interview. And we waited a long time. And then she looked up and said, I hated that. Those words, you can't be the key to every door. She said, so I decided to become the key to every door. Instead of pushing disruptive kids away, I began to seek them out. I began to bring them into my world. I read every book I could find. I kept notes. I ran experiments. I kept notes on the experiments. And then she kind of pulled herself up and said, today, I am the key to every door. When there's a disruptive, troubled kid in the school, they say, give her to Miss so-and-so. She seems to know what to do with them. That's a profoundly important story. It's a story of transformative learning. When I have a higher purpose, I find the energy and the courage to go outside my comfort zone. Now, the second story is a lot closer to home. I once had a daughter. She was single. She was living in Washington, DC. She had reached that point in life where she said, there's none, not a good man left on the earth. And then she found one and she got really excited. Relationship grew. And then one day our phone rang. She's talking to her mother and I know what's going on. This guy just dumped her. This daughter is the firstborn child. Many firstborn children share a common characteristic. If they're miserable, they want you to be miserable too. Okay? And she said, I'm coming home this weekend. I thought, oh, no, no. <laughs> her mother hangs up and says, you're the father. You go to the airport and pick her up. I, oh. So the next day I go pick her up. She gets in the car and she doesn't say, hello, how are you? She says, that no good, dirty, da, 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 da. Five minutes later, she takes a breath. And I said, are you problem solving or purpose finding? We're finally pulling in the driveway. She takes another breath. I say it again. She says, what are you talking about? And she said, this is the real world. I said, well, I think it applies to the real world. By then we're in the house. I pull out a sheet of paper out of my file, and it says, Robert Quinn, life state. She looks at it, and then she grows kind of quiet. And she looks up and says, when you feel bad, you read this? I said, no. When I feel bad, I rewrite it. It's been rewritten hundreds of times. She said, yeah, I can hardly understand some of this stuff. I said, yeah, it's written to a customized audience, one person. Then the first miracle happened. She said, do you think I could write one of these? And I said, I'm sure you can. She went in the bedroom. For a day and a half, she worked on her life statement. The miracle was, I did not have to suffer during that day. <laughs> She got on the plane, she flew home uh, to DC. A couple days passed, I get an email. She says, he called me. Oh, this will be interesting. And she says, so I wrote him this letter. And I'm reading this letter that she's attached. It's incredibly vulnerable, open, honest. 
And then at the bottom it says, and my roommate said I can't give this to him. Now that's an interesting thing. Why can't we give this letter to this guy? You don't tell some guy that dumped you that, you know, here's how you feel. And then she said, what my roommates don't understand is that what he thinks doesn't matter. Whoa, wait a minute. A few days ago, what he thought caused her life to shatter. Now she's saying, what he thinks doesn't matter. She's saying, this is who I really am. Didn't know this a while ago. Now I know it. It doesn't matter what other people think. You see, when you clarify your purpose, you take back your external locus of control where you worry about what other people think and you take an internal locus. You don't become insensitive. You don't become rebellious. You become sin. You become powerful. Now here's the interesting thing. In the next few months, she began to be promoted. Her career turned. Why? This was a dating breakup. Why is her career taking off? Because when you find purpose and meaning in what you're doing in one area of your life, it grows in every area of life because you are one person. That company had a woman coming in with the same dresses on, body looked the same, but it wasn't the same employee. This was a woman now full of leadership for the first time. When someone has that meaning and that integrity, things start to change. The research says when you give up self-interested goals, where most of us are most of the time, and you take on contributive goals, you function differently. The biology changes, the thought process changes, learning accelerates, you grow more. The only thing that I'm left to conclude is you and I are designed to be purpose-seeking mechanisms. You've been shaped by life. You've had bad experiences and good experiences. And both the bad experiences and the good experiences are there to teach you something about you. And if you look very carefully at those, you can determine what your purpose is. Every person in this room can clarify the purpose of their life, become the key to every door. I'm sitting at my computer and I'm crying. And I'm crying because I'm reading stories of kids as young as four and five years old they're walking every single day to collect dirty water. Water that ends up killing their brothers and their sisters and sitting there thinking, what if that was me? Imagine collecting water for them, they die from waterborne disease and I find out it was the water that I got them that killed them. Now at 19, I realize that's not my story, but the fact that it's some other young person's story in our world made me want to do something. And I'll never forget two numbers I saw. One. 900 million people in our world still don't have access to clean water. The second number, in 2008, we were spending $50 billion on bottled water. Today, it's $100 billion. What if you could combine the two extremes and sell a bottle of water that gives 100% of the profit to funding water projects? And in 2008, my best mate, my girlfriend and I, we founded Thank You bottle of water that gives 100% of the profit. And to be honest, we didn't know if you could call a brand or a product thank you. I'll never forget our first pitch. It was to the largest distributor of beverages in our country in Australia. But we got told by our factory manager, you'll never get in. They work for the largest beverage companies in the world and so they're not gonna take you. The way the industry works is you start small, you prove your model and you work your way up and maybe one day a group like that will be interested. When he told us that, we nearly canceled the pitch, but then we had this thought. And it's a thought that's turned out to be probably the, the most valuable thought we've ever had. But what if it worked? What if they said yes? And one hour into the pitch, they say yes. The director says, I'm gonna take 50,000 units from you. How quick can you get it to us? That was the day we learned that impossibility is only someone's opinion, not a fact. For the next three years, every single retailer in our country says no. We get knockbacks, we have two copyists, we have one go out and say, yeah, we're gonna stock you. And, and three weeks before the launch, when we've got production ready, they pull the launch. 
other deals with major retailers, we get down to the last minute and, and big brands would sweep in and do their deals. And for three years, we felt like failures. And for three years, we felt like this dream was impossible. But we couldn't walk away from the thought, but what if, what if it worked? Who says we have to do things the way they've always been done before? And we did that the day we launched this. It was a video on YouTube and it said, hey everybody, two weeks from today, we're presenting to 7-Eleven Australia. And right now we're asking you to jump onto their Facebook wall and say, 7-Eleven, if you stock thank you, I'd buy it. The clip goes viral and people start singing and dancing and rapping and uploading their videos onto the 7-Eleven Facebook wall and it worked. They said yes and at year three we land our first major retail deal. And they say when your idea works you should scale it. So we did. We spent the next two years developing a food range where all profit would fund food programs and then a body care range where all profit would fund health and sanitation projects. We then develop a tracker system where every product has its own unique tracker code. You type it into our website and it will zoom into the GPS coordinates of the, the well or the filter you're funding. And it's at this point at year five, people say to us, you're crazy, but not good crazy. You see, it's been five years and you can't get one bottle of water into any major grocery or supermarket store in Australia and people were right. For five years, we couldn't get our one product into the two biggest supermarkets in our country, Coles and Woolworths. They have 70% market share. And it was put to us, if you can't get one product in, how are you gonna get your 14 new products in? And all those who heard the idea said, that, that's not gonna work. Our thinking was, but what if it did? And one day we launched a little video on YouTube. We called it the Coles and Woolworths campaign. Now, media were like, you can't do that. You can't put the two biggest supermarkets who hate each other in the same sentence. And uh, I was like, well, oh, oh, Wesley, our graphic designer, he didn't find it too hard. He, he just sort of... <laughs> now, th this clip goes viral and people are singing, they're dancing, they're rapping. And then we may have flown this from a helicopter. Uh, said, hey, Coles, thank you for changing the world. In brackets, if you say yes, because we haven't met yet. And we flew over the city and around the head office for half an hour. <laughs> to be fair, Woolworths got one too, but my favorite part of the day was Peter and Jeff, the pilots, because they flew for free. I reckon every one of us in this room, outside this room, we want to do something. We want to use what's in our hand, our time, our money, our business, our resource, our helicopter, to help change the world, and we can. Because in industry record time, both supermarkets said yes. Product hits the shelf for, uh, one month later and what was 14 products is now 55 products on the market, including our new range of diapers, not nappies, that funds infant and maternal health projects. Of our 55 products, most are number two. Some are ranked number one in the industry, outselling every global competitor. But my favorite number is this one. The 755,000 lives impacted currently in our projects in 17 countries. Um, We feel like this is just the beginning, but um, I suppose I'm challenged by this thought that to get a result the world has never seen before, you have to be prepared to do something that the world has never seen before. And our idea was flawed from the start. We knew that. We give 100% of our profit. We have no shareholders. We have no investors. The flaw in the model is how do you scale it? How do you take it to new countries and new markets? And they're the dreams that we have. And when people kept telling us it's impossible, we were thought, yeah, we'll figure it out. And so we decided to do something that maybe the world hadn't seen before. And last year we launched this, a book. And when we launched chapter one, I, I think we lost sight of the shore. See, we launched the book in what appeared to be a misprint. It got printed the wrong way, but don't worry, we did our research. There was no bestseller, New York Times Australia, anywhere in the world written like this, it hit bestseller. We thought that's an opportunity. To make your ideas and dreams a reality, you've got to be willing to get out and stay out of your comfort zone. We are in chapter two, and thank you. Worlds is in chapter two. And I have no doubt that there will be people outside of this room who would look on at ideas like this and this, and maybe even this conference and say, yeah, a lot of excitement. Don't know if it'll ever really work but it takes courage to push past that. 
My all-time favorite quote is, courage is not the absence of fear, but the understanding that there is something more important than fear that exists. I, I suppose the critics will always look on and say, what if it doesn't work? And that's led us to ask, and I hope everyone in this room asks the same question. It's the most important question we can ever ask, and it's, but what if it does work? Because the answer to that is as a community, we will go on to change hundreds of millions of lives and our ideas will literally go on to shape the course of history if we have that courage to get out and stay out. First day of school, and I'm looking at the teacher and she's looking at me and she's talking to the principal and they're pointing at me and she walks over and she grabs my hand and she pulls me back into the first grade line. And all of a sudden, my friends in the second grade, they're looking at me and they're saying things like, Sean, you failed. Sean, you're stupid. Sean, you're dumb. Sean, you'll never make it. It's crazy because people's expectations can cap your realization. I get called down to the office and there's the principal and there's the psychologist and there's the sociologist and all the ologists are in the room, right? And they begin to test me for two days and they come back like Mrs. Harper. Your son has four to five documented learning disabilities. And he has to be in a special class and, and, and the list goes on and on. And the guy and, and my mom had a long discussion. And, and, you know, and at that moment, I ceased from being a bad boy to a mad boy. I, I started getting in fights every day, joining gangs, being kicked out of not one school, but two schools because of disciplinary issues. Leaving high school, listen, with a 1.62 accumulative GPA, nine on my ACT. First year at that junior college, I sit on the bench the entire season. Not one play. I'm watching all the starters get all the attention. I'm watching the coach literally look over me. And I pick up the phone the last game. And I called my mom. I said, Mom, I quit. I said, Mom, I want to come home. I said, Mom, just give me a bus ticket back to Columbus, 22 hours. I can get a job in the plant. I'm going to be okay, Mama. My mom said, baby, don't do it. She said, baby, hang in there. She said, Sean, I taught you how to fight. Sean, I taught you how to war. She said, Sean, I taught you how to win. I went back to that junior college, man. And I'm watching TV, three or four guys in a room. I jump up, it's called a Freudian slip. I said, man, I've always wanted to play Division I in NFL football. And one by one, the guy turned down the TV and he said, Sean, you'll never make it. Sean, you're not strong enough. Sean, you're not quick enough. Sean, you're not even starting now. And I sat down. But when I said the words, play NFL, it connected. It connected with the dream. You might not have nothing around you that validates the dream that's in you. Your friends might not see it. Your family might not see it. Heck, you might not even see it. But when you connect with your dream and you begin to speak your dream, you move into something much, much, much more powerful. It's not creation. It's called manifestation. NFL, that's where I'm going. Wrote down the letters, NFL, that's where I'm going, baby, I'm going. You know what is so funny? Because when the guys came back in, they begin to laugh, take that poster down that I wrote, man, take that crazy declaration down. I looked them all in the eye. I said, you, 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 raise up and get out of my room. Everyone can't go. Full scholarship, Indiana University. Block for two Heisman candidates. Draft to Andy NFL, third pick in the fourth round. Mel Kuyper Jr. said, where did this guy come from? on no one's radar. And you know what's so crazy? Is that when I was playing football, players would look at me and they would watch me drill from drill, even some coaches drill from drill, and, and, and teammates drill from drill, and they would say to themselves, he's not supposed to be here. How did he get here? Starting in front of me? And here comes this junior college transfer, starting left tackle. I was voted most likely to fail. That's Sean the loser. That's Sean the failure. But underneath all of that, the failure, the anger, the depression, the strife, I had a dream. There was a call 
and there was a purpose in my life. And each and every one of you, there is a dream, there is a calling, there's a purpose, and there's a destiny over your life. And the dream is like a seed. Don't ever forget this. You can often count the number of seeds in an orange, but you can never count the number of oranges in the seed. Outside of faith and, and love, there's nothing more powerful than the dream. The dream transcends time. The dream transcends all laws of nature. The dream transcends social economic settings. The, the, the dream transcends colors. The dream is either for you or meant to pass through you, but it should never be all about you. The dream, the dream, find it, find it. Have you allowed life to steal your dream? Have you allowed people to steal your dream, to crush your dream, to break your dream? If they break your dream, they'll break you. Where is your dream? So I used to be 60 pounds heavier, and I grew up in a morbidly obese family, and I really wanted to escape that fate, but I couldn't see any way to do it. All that I had was this crushing sense of being adrift at sea and not knowing how to get back to shore. I could see the failure. I could see that I had no plan, that I no longer knew how I was gonna get where I wanted to go. And I didn't believe that those were things that I could change about myself. They felt like a prison sentence, or if I'm honest, it felt like a death sentence. And it was coming to the realization that I wasn't talented that really forced me to look for a new mindset that would allow me to escape depression because I was coming to the world with my hand out. And as long as I was coming to the world with my hand out, I was at the mercy of other people. And if I wanted to take control, I was gonna have to get control of the resources. And in that was a desire to find another way to think about it, another way to think about myself, another way to think about talent, another way literally to think about everything. And I remember saying to myself, listen pussy, stop asking yourself what the least you need to do is and start asking yourself how much you can bear. I began to develop a growth mindset. I needed to believe that by working really hard, that I could get better at anything. And if that were true, then I just needed to buckle down, I needed to practice, I needed to get good, I needed to do the reps, I needed to put in the effort, I needed to be willing to break myself in half to get so good that people couldn't ignore me. The way to do that, act. That's it. You need to get out there and do something. Right now, today, literally, stop this fucking video and whatever it is, if you already have a passion, you are so much farther ahead than the vast majority of humankind. If you know what that thing is, get out and act. And by the way, if you don't know what it is, act. That's the only way that you're gonna find out. Go encounter stuff, go try things. It is in the process of action that you're gonna learn the things you need to learn. But if you've been thinking about starting a business, fucking start it, like actually build the product right now today. You will learn more, infinitely more, in the process of trying to create it and make it real than you ever will by watching videos, by thinking, by meditating on it, by taking notes. None of it compares. It's not even in the same universe. It's just going and doing it. One step is better than a hundred hours of pontification. Running a hundred miles an hour in the wrong direction is better than standing still. You'll learn something. So get rid of this notion that you're gonna end the day with a perfect record. You're gonna fail, you're gonna fuck up, you're gonna try a thousand things and 999 of them are not gonna work. But whatever you want, literally don't ask yourself who you are today. Ask only, who do you want to become and then are you willing to pay the price to get there? Like people are convinced that they, they shouldn't act until they have it all figured out. Fuck that, you should act right now today no matter how chaotic your vision, no matter how chaotic your life, no matter how much you have going on already, you're working two jobs, three jobs, doesn't matter. Take an action today or you never will. He literally challenged himself to be the best that he could all the days of his life. I have four degrees. My brother is a judge. We're not the smartest ones in our family. It's a third grade dropout daddy. 